our Bible study for this coming Sunday morning. Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 33 to 49. The crucifixion. Why was Jesus crucified? The method of execution practiced by the Jews was stoning, as in when they stoned Stephen, one of the first deacons. The Romans used crucifixion, not stoning. Another question, why was Jesus put to death? The religious officials interrogated him, asking, Are you the Son of God? Are you the Messiah, the Christ? Jesus acknowledged. He confessed. He said, Yes, I am. He spoke truth. He is truth. The religious leaders brought charges before Herod, and twice before Pilate, but they found no guilt in him. However, Pilate de delivered Jesus to their will, their will, what they wanted, they got. At Calvary, Jesus was crucified. In the translation, the version of the scriptures, the New American Standard, the word used as the skull, the skull, the place where he was crucified was called the skull. In the Latin Vulgate, we find the word in Latin from whence Calvary comes. And that has become the place that we today refer to. Jesus was crucified at Calvary. Notice in verses 33 through 38, the violent words of the people, the violent words the mob looking at Jesus, spoke. In verse 35, the rulers sneering, if this is the Christ, the Messiah, let him save himself. He saved others. How about Lazarus? He ought to be able to do that again. He saved himself. In verses 36 through 38, the soldiers joined in, mocking him and offering him sour wine. If you are the king of the Jews, the soldier said, then save yourself. In their words and actions, they demonstrated their will, the kind of a Messiah, a king they wanted, one who would do what they wanted, how they wanted it. Now notice the words of Jesus, the stark contrast between the violent words of the people and the soldiers. In verse, verse, the first part of verse 34, Jesus was praying for the sneering, the mocking people, including the religious rulers, the Roman soldiers, and others in the crowd. That 34th verse reads, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them. He did not save himself, for he determined to become the way to save them and us. He gave himself for us. He prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, he prayed. 
That is the imperative. The imperative. Forgive. He preached, love your enemies, in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, Jesus practiced what he preached. His love for sinful men. His love for us sinners was greater than the excruciating agony of the cross. On the cross, Jesus made a commitment. Verses 39 through 43. Notice the attempt of one criminal to use Jesus for his own purpose. Verse 39. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Save us. Save yourself and us. Hurling abusive words at Jesus. One of those criminals said, If you are the Messiah, then you say you are the Son of God. Then save us from death. Notice the response of the other criminal, the other thief on the other side of Jesus in verses 40 and 41. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we are indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. He spoke of fearing God. He spoke of their guilt. And they're getting what they deserved. The deeds of being put to death. Of Jesus, he said, being not guilty. In verse 42, he makes a request of Jesus. Remember uh, me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Here we have a rapid and near miraculous development of spiritual insight in those few hours. In crisis times, one has written, when the redemptive power of God is working, developments of insight, conviction, and faith are not exceptional. They happen in a very routine manner. Now then, look at verse 43. And he that is Jesus said to him, that's said to the other criminal in the cross, who requested to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus responded to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Jesus made a promise to the other criminal, today with me in paradise. The word paradise is found in the New Testament also in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 4. And you'll find it in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. The word means heaven. Paradise, the place where God dwells with his people. The place where the penitent man, the criminal who repented and asked to be remembered by Jesus, would be with Jesus before the day was over. Before the day was over. Today, 
Jesus said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Luke's first saying of Jesus on the cross, Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of sinners. In his second, in Luke's second recorded saying from the cross, Jesus granted forgiveness and the assurance of a blessed destiny to the penitent sinner. Now then, on the cross, Jesus prayed to the Father in verses 44 and 45. And it was now about the sixth hour Darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. As the sun being obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Notice that darkness fell over the whole land. Matthew and Mark, as well as Luke, use the word that means the physical earth. The whole land is the physical earth, not just the land of Judea, not the region of the Roman Empire, the whole land. The sixth hour is noon for us on our time pieces. The ninth hour is three in the afternoon. The sun being obscured, some have written that that means there was an eclipse of the sun by the moon. Couldn't have been. The moon was on the other side of the earth at this time of day in that month of, probably of April. The sun being obscured, it was like an eclipse. The veil of the temple was torn in the middle it was torn in the middle. The darkness is an act of the Creator and declares that son, sin must be judged. God judged sin in the death of His Son on the cross. In the darkness, now, Jesus prayed, crying with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus died with a prayer on his lips. He prayed, quoting Psalm 31 and verse 5, addressing his father. William Barclay points out that prayer, that prayer, was the first prayer that every Jewish mother taught her child to say last thing at night before the threatening dark came down. In the Gospel of John 19 and verse 30, John gives us another detail. He says, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Greek word translated in English as bowed is used in other places to describe a man peacefully letting his head sink back upon his pillow that he might sleep. For Jesus, there came peace after the long battle, rest after the bitter toil, the ease after agony. He died with the child's good night prayer upon his lips. He died having finished the will, the plan of God, bringing with him into paradise the forgiven criminal. Just think of it. He died. Having finished God's will, God's plan,
for him upon this earth, bringing with him into paradise the other criminal who asks to be remembered. On the cross, Jesus prayed twice and made one promise. He prayed, Father, forgive them. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He promised and he kept. Today you shall be with me in paradise. How about us? Do we pray for our enemies, whoever they may be? Today, do you know that you will be with Jesus in paradise? When your day is dark, deep within your spirit, do you pray, Father, into your hands I commit myself. Think about it.